Ziptera Core. Trying to avoid glare, but this cover needs a lot of light for you to be able to see what it is. This game has quite a bit of a backstory, so I'm just going to cover some. Basically, there's a planet called Septera Core, or just Septera. The reason for this interesting name is that in Latin, Sept, as in September, means seven. Terra means Earth. And this planet has seven layers. And this literally does mean that there are masses of Earth that are floating above other masses of Earth. And all of these masses of Earth are rotating in different directions. There is no water between these masses of Earth, so there is room for light to pass through, and at the very core of these seven layers, at the very lowest layer, there is a core, and this core is activated I think it's every 100 years, but it's there's a certain amount of time pass, passes between each time that light reaches this, because it requires for the alignment to be very exact of all these land masses. And when this happens, if someone is near the core, and if it's the right people, they can be granted the Kingdom of Heaven. Now, this is an old story, and many, many years, many of these cycles have passed. But there are now people who believe that this is the time. It is them who are the right ones. The chosen ones. And there are actually, there is actually 50 years before this alignment will be perfect again, but they aren't going to wait that long. And we join Maya, a blue haired girl a junker, meaning she lives off the junk that others throw down onto her layer. And she finds out that something is wrong, and she gets some friends, and she starts fighting against this rebellion, which it really is. Some of the chosen, some of those who consider themselves chosen, are starting a rebellion because the other chosen ones realize that it's very dangerous to mess around with the planet's natural cycle. Also, Maya's parents were killed in a war by some of the Chosen, so she does have a bit of a personal interest. The world has these seven layers, and you get to go to all of them. You start on the second layer, which is where all the Junkers live. That's because the first layer is the Chosen Ones. They don't really think about the other layers. They think about them as subhuman. You know, they're not as important as the Chosen Ones. The Chosen Ones are, or at least consider themselves to be, the descendants of the gods. The good gods, anyway. And they believe that they are the ones who should act 
activate the core. And they, when they're, when they have trash, they throw it onto the second shell, which is how they're referred to in the game. The junkers pick it up and build whatever they need from this. The third shell, it has a one very big city, and there are some religious institutions. There, oh, one religious institution. There's a church and a holy guard, and this city is one of the biggest on the shells, and certainly the biggest law-abiding one. The fourth shell has the biggest city of any shell, and it's not law-abiding at all. It's like, there's a red light district, there's a bounty hunter district. This is where you go if you want something that isn't legal, basically. The fifth shell has two warring factions, the Ankara and the Janam. And they've been at war several times already, and recently it's been relatively peaceful between them, but it's maybe not gonna last that long. The sixth shell is where the pirates stay, and the seventh which is the near, nearest to the core, is where mining operations take place. And everyone who stays there for an extended period of time gets mutated by all the gases and radiation down there. It's a very dark, nasty place, very dangerous, and you're not actually going to get very far without having to use earplugs and gas masks. Anyway, all shells are very distinct. You can always tell which one you're on. And it really feels like you get to travel an entire world in this game, which is why I spent all that time describing the different ones. It feels like this is a place that's existed for a long time. Everything is natural. Everything is something that's come from some kind of movement, or there's been a reaction to someone. So there's religion, there is, there are warring factions, you know, there are pirates, there are those who break the law, and then there are those that uphold it and don't question it. And this is an RPG. So you get to form a party and you travel around with these various ones. Now the first three you control. At the very beginning you only control Maya, but very soon after her best friend, whose name escapes me at the moment, he's a mechanic. And this best friend's robot dog, yes, join. And the rest of the game you're always traveling with three, and you usually have to use Maya, because this is a very story-driven game. There's not really any optional paths to take. There are optional quests which can improve things for your party or get you certain items that you might like to get, but the whole is really linear. You also get various others. You get another robot, my personal favorite character, Lobo, who has a machine gun, submachine gun, a solar rifle really, and he can turn around, and I don't mean like this, I mean like his torso can spin and he can be firing, so he can hit every enemy on screen with one attack. Granted, everyone has one attack that can hit everyone, many have grenade attacks, some can poison others, there are various things you can do in combat, you know role-playing game and combat, 
you probably already have an idea of what it's like. In this game, it is turn-based, though. It's not... It enters a turn-based mode whenever you enter combat. You also get a bounty hunter, one of the chosen. There are various different ones. The environments were very diverse, and the enemies also, and they really feel organic to the areas. Early on, you're traveling through a desert, so you face crabs and wolves. And later on, you'll face giant insects, you'll face robots, there are various ones. You'll fight zombies, which you can actually harm far more by giving them healing items than just by attacking them. Healing items, obviously, you can buy a ton of different ones. They cost a certain amount based on how much they're going to heal, if they're going to heal more than one person. You only lose the game if all members of your party die in combat. If at least one of them survives combat, the others come back to life. They just only have one health point. Everyone has a total of nine regular attacks. Some of them you have to buy attachments to their weapon for. And like I said, everyone has an attack that attacks everyone. Several of them have an attack that hits everyone in a straight line. Various ones, and there are advantages to some of them. And the enemies also have various attacks. One thing that makes this very interesting is the use of magic. You pick up magic cards as you go, and each magic card has one specific function, but you can combine it with others for other functions based on that general area, like the fire card in itself will just burn someone, but if you use it with the summon card, you summon the god of fire, and that deals a lot more damage than just fire. Then there are the very nice cards, all, which makes the other two, the, the combination of magic, affect everybody, and mirror, which reverses the effect of any magic, and that one can be kind of interesting. My personal favorite attacks are when you get the card... The effect is called Law. What it really does is dispel all negative effects that affect the mind of a character. Like, they can be... The berserker can be cast on them. That kind of explains itself. Basically, the character will attack whoever, you know, you no longer control that character. The other card in that mix is Chaos, and those two are of course opposites. Put together, they give Destroyer, which is quite powerful in, its, in and of itself. If you combine that with All, the All card, you get the Big Bang. And that one affects everybody, every enemy, or every ally, if you accidentally target yourself, and does a lot of damage. And the other one is if you use the Mirror card with Law and Chaos, which gives you Black Hole. And that one is also awesome. Also doing a lot of damage, also to everyone. The animations for these attacks are very nice, both the magic attacks and the regular ones. There are some laser attacks, for example, beams. And in general, things just look quite nice in combat. The CGI is also nice, but there aren't that many excuse me, scenes. 
the magic is one of the things that really make this enjoyable and sets it apart from others because I don't play a lot of these role-playing games but I realize that many of them are non-linear allow more freedom than this game does some of them don't have the whole some of them have real-time combat you know not turn-based so there are some things about this game that place it below its competition. I would also say that the world and the mythology is just very interesting. It's clear that they get inspiration from real life and as far as the mythology goes they get ideas quite clearly from actual mythologies being a an, an enthusiast enthusiast of Norse mythology myself, I recognize several traits from there in this, but it's all very nicely done. And maybe many other role-playing games have mythology, but I don't know, I get the impression that most of them follow an overall idea of mythology, and this one really doesn't. Also, it does have robots, which I'm not sure that many other medieval, essentially medieval, role-playing games have. This really isn't set in medieval times. It's not set on our world, and it never claims to be. It just happens to have human or humanoid beings. But there are also many others, and there aren't any trolls or such. There are supernatural beings and various things, but machinery is an integral part in integral part of several shells of this world. So anyway, overall I would say it is interesting if you like mythology, if you like delving into a world and you don't mind losing some freedom to get that. And the magic is just plain fun. You don't start with any of it, but you... and the first couple of cards maybe aren't that great. It it takes a little while before it gets really interesting, but once it does, it just keeps getting more and more fun. So you have all the cards, and once you hold all the cards, the game gets really fun. You can really abuse the crap out of some of the lower level enemies. One more I do gotta mention of cards is Joker, which puts all negative magic effects on any targeted enemy, and yes, it can be combined with all. One thing I would say is that the game is a little too long. I've played it at least three times, and every time, no matter how much I try to keep up the enthusiasm, near the end, the last 5% of the game, maybe 10, I'm just wanting it to be over. And when I get there, when I defeat the final boss, what should be a yes, awesome moment is really more finally. And that's unfortunate. But until then, it's a ton of fun. So if anybody has a computer which can still run it, Overall, I would recommend it. That was my spoiler-free review of Septera Core. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.